Is a line equal to a square? At first, this question may sound a bit ridiculous. Of course they're different. A line is one dimension, a square is two dimensions. Intuitively, the answer is obvious. The question becomes trickier though when we try to justify this intuition. Maybe, just maybe, there is a way we could twist, bend, and distort the line segment so that it eventually becomes a square, and then reshape that square back into a line. When we put it this way, the question of whether a line is equal to a square becomes a little fuzzier. Do a line and a square have the same fundamental shape? Let's explore this question together, and along the way we will learn about the crisis this question gave mathematicians around the start of the 20th century. We will discover how mathematicians came to define dimension. And then finally, we'll connect two different areas of mathematics, graph theory and topology, to answer this question. The answer takes a bit to work towards, but I hope this journey leaves you with a greater appreciation for the beautiful insight that mathematics can give us into the world. For the longest time, mathematicians assume dimension is simply how many numbers you need to describe where you are in a particular object. A line segment is one dimension because you need one number to describe where you are. A square is two dimensions because you need two numbers, such as an x and y coordinate, to describe a specific point. This assumption about dimensions, however, was completely overturned by mathematician Georg Cantor. He found there was actually a way to take a point on the square and interweave the two coordinates together to get a single number on a line segment. You can then take the single number, unweave it, and go back to the square and find the original point. In other words, you can use a single number to uniquely describe every single point on the square. Another way to look at it is Cantor found a way to uniquely pair every single point on a line segment with one on the unit square, and vice versa. Although this may seem counterintuitive at first, putting the points from each shape in a one-to-one -one correspondence shows that the line segment has the same number of points as the square. Crazy, right? To summarize, Contour found a way to pair numbers from the unit line segment onto the square and vice versa. By the way, the letter f refers to a function or a way to pair points or numbers together. In our case, the function f takes points from the line segment and associates them with a point on the square. Contour's method pairs these points in a one-to-one -one fashion. The only limitation with Contour's function is that this process is not continuous. For a function to be continuous means that a little change to the input will lead to just a little change in the output. If contours function were continuous, then a path along the square would mean the corresponding points on the line segment would be smoothly connected. No jumps or breaks allowed. What actually happens with contours function is that a smooth path on the square corresponds with a bunch of disconnected points that you jump around to on the line segment. By being discontinuous, contours function is as if you cut the line segment into a bunch of tiny points and then covered the square with those points. This raises an interesting question. Is there a way to map the line segment to the square continuously? And in fact, there is. Giuseppe Peano, in response to Contour's discovery, found a way to do so. He began by stretching the line segment to cover a portion of the square. By moving along this line segment, we can move along some portion of the square. We can make this path even finer by adding more twists and turns. If we repeat this process infinitely many times, we can actually create a path across the square that visits every single point. This path is unsurprisingly called a space-filling curve. Peano's curve is a function that maps the line segment to completely cover the square. Most importantly, 
this function is continuous. However, just like contours pairing, Peano's curve also has a pretty big limitation. As we take the path to its limit, the path starts to intersect it. It was as if Peano had to glue parts of the line together in order to cover the entire square. So there still seems to be something fundamentally different in the shape of a line segment versus a square. I want to show you one more way we can map the line segment onto the square. We could just put the line segment on the bottom edge of the square, and this in fact would be continuous. I think we can agree that it would be rather silly to say that this demonstrates a line and a square have the same shape. The line doesn't even begin to cover the vast majority of the square. This brings us to the first way we can reframe the question of whether a line is equal to a square in some sense. Is there a function from a line to a square that is continuous, does not intersect itself, and completely covers the square? We can actually combine the last two statements and ask more succinctly. Is there a continuous one-to-one -one function between a line and a square? To describe this visually, is there a way to distort, twist, and bend the line segment so that it becomes a square? It would also make sense, if we want to say the shapes are the same, for us to be able to reverse this process as well. If this is possible, then we can say in a rather strong sense that a line segment and a square have the same fundamental shape. What we are looking for, then, is what mathematicians call a homeomorphism, a function that is continuous, has a one-to-one -one correspondence, and also has a continuous inverse. This last condition we haven't really talked about yet, but the reason why we need this last condition is because it is actually possible to connect two line segments together without technically gluing anything together. Yet, we can see that two line segments is very different than one line segment. We want to say these two are different. We can observe, though, that by reversing this process, going from the one line segment back into the two line segments, we actually have to cut the line segment in half. So we can avoid this situation altogether by simply requiring that the inverse be continuous. To put this all a bit more intuitively, we say that two objects have the same fundamental shape if there is some way to reshape one object into the other without cuts, without gluing or missing any parts, and if we can also reverse the process. Now that we have defined homeomorphisms, we can have a better understanding of one of the most important areas in all of mathematics, topology. Topology is the study of the properties of a geometric object unchanged by homeomorphisms. An example of this is the number of holes an object has. No matter how much we twist and distort an object with a hole in it, there is no way to reshape it into an object without a hole. Holes are a topological property, unchanged by homeomorphisms. We use this notation of an equal sign with the squiggly line over it to say that two objects are not homeomorphic, not the same shape. In contrast, we can say that a triangle is homeomorphic to a square. We can reshape a triangle into a square and back again. The two are homeomorphic. One thing I want to emphasize here is that topology gives us a completely different way to think about shapes. Instead of having to focus on measurement questions such as what is the angle here or what is the length of this line segment, we can begin to start asking questions more about the fundamental structure of the object. Like, how many holes does it have? How many pieces does it have? And hopefully, how many dimensions does it have? To solve our question about the line and the square, we simply need to find out whether there is a homeomorphism between the two. And we can accomplish this by finding some definition of dimension and showing that an object's dimension does not change under a homeomorphism. If line and square have different dimensions, that we can confidently say they are different shapes. One thing I want to make clear is that this question is not just about lines and squares, but about dimension in general. For example, is a square homeomorphic to a cube? Is there a way to reshape the square into a cube? This general question of dimension is called the invariance of dimension problem, whether two spaces with different dimensions are homeomorphic. 
To solve this question, we first need to have a better understanding of what is dimension, beyond simply how many numbers you need to describe where you are. To tackle the question of what is dimension, I think it's worth spending some time thinking about what we would like to see in a definition of dimension if we can find one. There are two requirements that come to mind. The first is we would want our definition of dimension to be meaningful. That is to say, it should match our intuition of how we normally think of dimension. So a point should be zero dimensions, a line one, a square two, and a cube three. The second requirement for a good definition of dimension is that it should be useful, something we can do mathematics with. Returning to our discussion on homeomorphisms earlier, this means that if we can show two spaces to be homeomorphic, then the two should also have the same dimension. So in this case, if the triangle has two dimensions, then the square should also have two dimensions. The exciting thing is that there are quite a few different ways of looking at dimension that meet these two requirements. The first of which was developed by L.E.J. Brower in 1912. His notion of dimension is an inductive one, meaning he uses lower dimensional objects to define higher dimensional objects. So in this case, a square is two dimensions because it can be separated by a line, which is one dimension. The definition we are using in today's video, though, is one that was inspired by ideas from Henri Lebeg. Lebeg came up with a definition of dimension based on some keen observations of what happens when you try to tile a surface. Lebeg noted that whenever you use bricks of a small enough size, then it seems that three of them are going to intersect at some particular point. Now you can rearrange the bricks so more than three intersect, but the key idea is you don't have to. You can always rearrange it so that no more than three of them intersect. And the only way you can avoid three of the bricks intersecting is if you stretch them so large so that they touch opposite sides of the plane. But assuming the bricks are small enough, three of them are going to intersect. And this is the Lebesgue covering dimension. The actual definition is a bit more complicated, so what I have here is a simplification. That, if you tile an object with sufficiently small tiles, and at least n plus one of them always intersect, no matter how you tile it, then the dimension of the object is n. In other words, if I use small enough tiles on a plane, and three of them always intersect, then the plane has dimension 2. What we should consider now is whether the Lebesgue covering dimension satisfies both of our requirements from earlier. Let's start with whether this definition is meaningful or matches our intuition. The point can be tiled with just one set, and this tile trivially intersects itself. So there's one set that has an intersection, therefore the point has zero dimensions. It seems, on a line segment, if I use small enough segments, that two of them will intersect at some point, no matter what I do. Hence, the dimension of a line segment should be 1. Finally, for a plane, if we use small enough bricks, as we saw earlier, then three of them should intersect somewhere. So it seems that the low bag covering dimension does match our intuition of what dimension ought to be. Now, I want to be clear that I have not actually proven the Lebesgue covering dimension of any object. We haven't shown that a line is one dimension, for example. Now the question is whether this definition is useful, something we can do mathematics for. What we want to see is that if two objects are homeomorphic, then they should have the same Lebesgue covering dimension. Here's a quick taste to see why this is actually the case. If we tile the triangle with small enough tiles, in this case, none of the tiles touch all three sides, so in that sense they are small, then three of them should intersect at some point, assuming the triangle has dimension 2. This means, under a homeomorphism, when we look at where the tiles go, then they should still 
intersect at some particular point. And in fact, if they do not, then that means some hole was created in our square, making our whole homeomorphism no longer continuous. So it seems then that for small enough tiles, we should also be able to find three of them that intersect on the square as well. And if a triangle then is homeomorphic to a square, then if the Lebesgue covering dimension of the triangle is two, then the Lebesgue covering dimension of the square should also be two. We can reformulate our square and line segment question one last time. If the dimension of the line segment is one, and the dimension of the square is two, then we can conclude that the two are not homeomorphic. To accomplish this goal, we need to turn to a completely different area of mathematics called graph theory. Let's begin by trying to figure out the dimension of just a line segment. If we color a line segment with two different colors, say orange and purple, we want to show that if the tiles are small enough, then orange and purple should touch at some particular point. To make this job easier, we are going to use graph theory. Graph theory is, unsurprisingly, the study of graphs. Graphs are made up of two different things. Nodes or vertices and edges, which when combined forms a graph. You can think of a graph as a network showing the relationship between different points. We can return to our problem by turning the line segment into a graph and coloring each of the nodes in the graph either orange or purple. What we want to determine is whether there is an edge that has both an orange node and a purple node. In order to find an edge that has both an orange node and a purple, we do need to place one restriction on how we color the graph. We require that the endpoints be different colors. And the reason why we do this is if we do not, then we open ourselves up to the case where the line segment is colored with just one single color, such as orange, meaning that the corresponding graph just has orange nodes, meaning we won't be able to find an edge as both orange and purple. You can think of this as the case when the tile is too big. We need to make the tiles small enough. If we color the endpoints different colors, and then fill in the rest of the nodes of the graph however we wish. We start on the left-hand side and work our way over towards the other endpoint. At some point, the colors have to switch, and whenever they do so, we have found our line segment. Something else that is interesting to note is that the number of orange-purple edges is an odd number. And the reason why this is always the case is that there must be at least one of these segments for the initial switch from orange to purple, and then some multiple of two after that. Because every time we switch back to orange, we also have to switch back to purple, thus adding two more. Now we can demonstrate that a line has dimension one. To do so, we apply a graph to our line segment after we have tiled it with orange and purple tiles. What we observe is that if there is an edge in our graph that has an orange side and a purple side, then that means on the corresponding line that there must be a intersection point between orange and purple. So what we do is we apply finer and finer graphs to our line, and this allows us to approximate with greater and greater precision where these intersection points are we need one feature of the line called compactness, which for the purposes of our example states that if you can approximate a intersection with arbitrarily high precision, then the intersection actually exists. This means that if you tie a line segment with sufficiently small tiles, then two of them will intersect at some point. And we can also show rather trivially that the line segment does not have dimension two. The reason being is we can color a line segment with three colors and clearly we can ensure that only two of the colors are touching at any particular point. We have now completed the first step. Now we just have to show that a square has dimension two. To do so we consider a triangle and within our triangle we are trying to find 
a subtriangle that has three differently colored nodes in it. To ensure that one of these special triangles exists, we begin by coloring each of the corners of the triangle a different color. And then along each of the edges of the triangle, we color the nodes only based on what two corners they are between. So for example, between the orange corner and the red corner on the bottom, all of those nodes must be either orange or red. Once we have established the coloring of the border of the graph, then we can color the rest of the graph however we wish. There is a way to demonstrate that somewhere in this triangle, there is a mini triangle that has three differently colored nodes. You may recognize what we are doing as a proof called Sperner's Lemma. Sperner's Lemma was actually developed in the context of trying to show what the dimension of an object is. So this is Sperner's Lemma in its original context. To identify this special triangle, we first consider the bottom row of our graph and notice that it is just like the one-dimensional case we saw earlier. We recall that the number of red-orange segments should be an odd number. What we consider now is what happens if we treat these red-orange segments as doors and the triangles in our graph as rooms. We can think of each triangle as a room we can walk through if there is a red-orange edge in that room. We observe there are three possible types of rooms in our graph. The first is a graph where all the nodes are the same color. This is a locked room that we cannot enter. The second case is where the triangle is colored with both red and orange nodes, and this is a room we can in fact enter and exit. The final case are the rooms that have three differently colored nodes. And these are rooms we can enter, but there is no way for us to exit. Returning to our main graph, let's observe what happens when we try to walk through the graph, entering through one of the doors on the bottom. This particular door gives us a path into the graph, but then also takes us back out another door on the bottom. In other words, this path takes up two doors. Because there are an odd number of doors on this bottom row, that means there must be one of these doors that enters the graph, goes through different rooms, but doesn't come back out, meaning it ends somewhere inside the triangle. And the only way it can end inside the triangle is if it finds a room of three different colors. Now let's relate this to tiling a triangle in general. If we color a triangle such that no color can touch all three sides, and we do this by ensuring that each edge of our triangle only has two colors on it, so in this case you can see the bottom edge just has red and orange, then we can apply a graph on top of the triangle and use our doors and rooms analogy from earlier to walk through this graph and eventually find one of the triangles in the graph that has all three colors. And this means that somewhere inside this triangle, there must be a point where the three different colors intersect. What's cool is you can see that the path we took represents the boundary between the red and the orange region. That stops when the red and the orange regions touch a purple region. This is the point we are looking for. And just as before with one dimensions, we can do this with a finer and finer precision to locate and identify the actual intersection. We can conclude that a triangle will have three colors that intersect at some particular point if the tiles are small enough. In other words, a triangle has dimension two. And since the triangle is homeomorphic to a square, the square also has dimension two. Finally, since the square and the line segment have different dimensions, that means there does not exist a homeomorphism between a line segment and a square. The two have fundamentally different shapes. In conclusion, I hope you have enjoyed this journey, learning how a very simple question about whether a line segment and a square are the same 
took us through a whole world of mathematics, including topology and graph theory, to answer this question. I want to leave you with two final things. The first is that there are numerous mathematical connections to the ideas we discuss here today. Here are just a few theorems that are all related to Sperner's formula and the Lebesgue covering dimension that we have talked about today. I encourage you to look those up and see if you can figure out why they are connected. The final thing I want to leave you with is to let you know that there are many resources in the description of this video if you are interested in learning more. Thank you so much for watching this video. I'm so grateful to be able to have participated in the Summer Math Exposition, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the videos that are also coming up.